Well, welcome everybody, and a special welcome to Professor Jane. He's glad to go, he got here after um, some issues with the travel. So we're going to start the technical session this morning. Um, the, the first speaker is our Head of Department in Physics at Penn State. It is uh, Nitin Samar, and he's going to speak on the topological insulator heterostructures, novel routes to 2D spintronics. So, Nitin. Um, thanks, Clive. And I want to thank the, uh, <clears throat> thank the committee, um, the Taylor Lecture Committee, for giving me the opportunity to um, talk about this work here. I hope the mic's working okay. <clears throat> How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> um, as you know, the theme of this, um, uh, you know, of these Taylor lectures this year is uh, sort of 2D or low-dimensional materials, and um, I'm going to give you an overview of a field that I've been involved in now. Um, broadly for about a couple of decades, and that is now going into a new area called topological insulators. Um, so the, uh, um, the outline of the talk is um, what you see over here. I'm going to first of all talk about spintronics, give you a little bit of an overview um, of the field and what is spintronics all about, um, and then I'm going to move on to this new topic of topological insulators and try to present an argument that um, if you're interested in spintronics, as I and some of my colleagues are, um, then um, these new materials called topological insulators provide you a way to, um, um, to carry out the kind of um, schemes we are envisioning for spintronics in a very natural and seamless way. Um, and so I'll describe the concepts behind topological insulators. I'll describe the materials. Um, and describe the phenomena, and then also talk to you a little bit about where we are in terms of um, spintronics, and then conclude with um, you know, so a summary and outlook. Um, so I used to teach our modern physics class um, several years ago. And while teaching the modern physics class, we would start with the special theory of relativity um, and go through quantum mechanics. And, and you know, the class was full of both science and engineering students. And very often, um, engineering students would ask me, well, you know, quantum mechanics is fine. I see myself perhaps doing that if I go into certain classes of electronic materials. But why should I know about the special theory of relativity? And I would point out, of course, that every time you use your GPS device, you know, it wouldn't be working unless you had relativistic corrections. But in a somewhat more mundane way, what most people don't perhaps realize is that every day, in fact, these days, most of your life, depends on, um, uh, on, on the pillars of quantum mechanics, the relativity and quantum, uh, uh, pillars of physics, relativity and quantum mechanics. So in other words, these two gentlemen here, Paul Dirac and, and Albert Einstein, are really what um, um, you know, have came up with the concepts that allow us to store information in hard disks. And the reason for this is because the way one comes up with the concept of electron spin in physics is only when one combines the ideas of quantum mechanics with the ideas of special theory of relativity. In other words, the Schrodinger equation does not give you electron spin in, um, in a fundamental way, but um, Dirac's equation um, does. And so it tells you that a, an electron has a spin one half. In other words, when you put an electron in a magnetic field, um, then the electron can have two spin states, spin up and spin down, because it has spin one half. More interestingly, if you carry out the calculation of relativity and quantum mechanics in, 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 to its completion, you find that there is something called the spin-orbit coupling. In other words, the momentum of an electron is coupled to its spin um, via a term that looks like this, via a Hamiltonian or an energy term that looks like this. And essentially, the reason why this occurs is because if you go into the moving frame of the electron, then relativity tells us that an electric field, the gradient of a potential, um, um, sorry, gradient of a potential gets, just go through this again here, the gradient of a potential gets um, converted into a magnetic field, okay? Um, and so, remarkably, these effects of spin and spin-orbit coupling are really what underlie 
um, our understanding of solid state systems and their band structure, the electronic band structure, and also magnetism. So these are really fundamentally at the root of everything that we do with solid state um, physics and devices and, and materials these days. Um, it turns out that in crystalline solids, the spin orbit coupling term um, takes on um, a magnitude which is orders of magnitude larger than in a free atom. And this is what allows to do interesting things with, um, you know, with, uh, with spins and spin orbit. Um, and this is what led to the field of spintronics. So this word spintronics, you know, sometimes people ask me, what does it mean and where does it come from? Um, well, it turns out that it's an acronym that was invented purely for funding purposes. It was, fu it was created by Stu Wolf, who was a program manager at DARPA at the time, and a very, very successful program manager because he knew how to encapsulate physical ideas into a buzzword and sell that buzzword to the people who provide the money in, in the military brass. And he did it in a very convincing way. And one of his major successes was the idea that one could exploit um, Nobel Prize winning discoveries by Albert Fert and Peter Grunberg to create the next generation or the current generation of, um, at that time, next generation of magnetic recording um, technologies. Um, and there were two phenomena that were, um, you know, that, that constituted the, the, the basis for this um, spintronics at the time. And these are known as giant magnetoresistance and tunneling magnetoresistance, purely quantum mechanical phenomena. And this is what's in your hard drive these days. This is how you read the information from your hard drive. And what they depend on are the orientations of two metallic ferromagnets. So imagine that I make a layered structure in which I have two metallic ferromagnets um, and they're separated by something that's non-magnetic. When these magnetizations point opposite to each other and when they uh, point parallel to each other, you get different resistances. So it's a very sensitive um, uh, you know, magnetic field sensor. And this is what this misnomer of spintronics was initially applied to. But as the word sort of implies, you would imagine that you could try to use these ideas of spins and spin transport or you know, spin transport electronics for actually carrying out logic with semiconductors. And that's what many of us have been interested in for the last few decades. Um, so the ideas that we tried to come up with um, can be described by this phrase of spintronics without magnetism. In other words, what if I gave you an ordinary semiconductor, you know, silicon, gallium arsenide, um, germanium, something like that. Can you use spins in those semiconductors in the same way that we use them in ferromagnetic metals. Now you might say, well, that's crazy because in a ferromagnet, I know that spin is explicitly involved. You know, all the magnetic moments are pointing in some direction. But how can that happen in a semiconductor? Well, it happens because of the spin orbit interaction. Look at this remarkable piece of data over here. This is carried out by my colleagues, um, Dave Avshalom at Santa Barbara, and we've done many collaborative experiments with him exploring these kinds of effects. And what that image here shows is um, a picture of the spin polarization in a standard routine uh, crystal of gallium arsenide as you flow a current. So you take a crystal of gallium arsenide, connect a battery across it, pass a current through it, something that device engineers have been doing for, for decades, except that now you go and look for spin. So you carry out an optical experiment which is sensitive to the spin signal in the gallium arsenide. And you can do this with circularly polarized light or with the rotation of linearly polarized light. And this image here shows that on one edge of the crystal, you get um, spins pointing up. On the other edge, you get spins pointing down. This is something called the spin hall effect. So there are a variety of characteristics of spins in semiconductors that are very attractive. They have long spin lifetimes. They have long spin diffusion lengths. They, have, they can be transported through interfaces. We can control them by using photons or by electric fields. and um, um, you know, and so, so there's a number of things that one can do with spins, but the question is, can you actually make devices of some kind? Well, unlike the mature technology of, of spintronics with metals, we are still very far from making real devices with semiconductors, spin devices with semiconductors. But there are many interesting proposals. One of the interesting proposals um, was, first propo uh, was first put forward by Shupriyo Datta at, um, at Purdue University. And he didn't try to sell this as some fancy device that's going to change the world or anything like that. 
he simply proposed this as a very interesting um, um, exercise that showed that one can take, one can make something that looks like a field effect transistor, but whose um, functionality, you know, depends on the state of spin of an electron. And it relies on this idea of spin orbit coupling and the idea of this relativistic transformation of an electric field into a magnetic field. And the idea is quite simple. Um, you take a semiconductor in which the source and the drain are ferromagnets. You then inject a spin from the semiconductor, a spin polarized current into the semiconductor. As that spin carries, you know, flows, you apply with the gate an electric field. The electric field, in a very hand-waving and somewhat inaccurate way, but sort of essentially correct, um, the electric field in the reference frame of the electron looks like a magnetic field, and the electron spin then processes in that magnetic field. So you can arrange your device so that something that goes in with one spin comes out with spin that's opposite, and you can turn the device on and off in this way, okay? Um, another device that's been proposed more recently by Michael Flatte at the University of Iowa is a sort of more direct equivalent of a MOSFET, and that also relies on changing the spin states of electrons, and I won't go into too much detail, but the basic idea is you can propose devices of this kind, and, and many of us have been successful at making some headway towards making devices of this sort. But the basic problem still is that even in these devices, you are still flowing electric currents. You are still flowing charge. You know, you're, and, and so you don't really gain an advantage compared with uh, technologies such as CMOS. So the question is, is there an alternative approach? And, um, and the approach for developing a spintronics for logic has again been recently put forward by Shupriya Datta at Purdue. And he's come up with this very imaginative scheme. It's still a theoretical proposal in which one can come up with architectures that depend on um, and that, that depend on, on elements that are known as magnetic tunnel junctions. And these are made with ferromagnetic metals. They work at room temperature. There's nothing physically impeding you from, uh, you know, from getting these things to work at room temperature. And then um, these nanomagnetic tunnel junctions act like digital spin capacitors. And the way you change their state is by using a phenomenon which is called spin torque. So this is a phenomenon in which when you flow a current, through such a device, because of conservation of angular momentum, you can change the orientation of a um, mesoscopically or nanomagnetically patterned device. Now, how do these things communicate? They communicate via not the flow of current, but rather diffusive spin currents. These are called non-local spin currents. They're not as large as uh, you know, uh, charge currents that you would have in standard devices, and hence the calculations that Shupriya and his group have made um, indicate that these diffusive spin currents that communicate and control these bits, which are magnetic tunnel junctions, can actually provide a way to figure, you know, a, a, a pathway towards low dissipation um, computing. And so um, a recent project that's been funded through DARPA and the SRC um, and headed by University of Minnesota has a lot of us um, you know, working on this particular idea. But the basic problem still is what do I use for that channel? What do I use for the channel material? You know, I just told you that semiconductors have these amazing characteristics that I can put a spin in and I can transport it over 100 microns before it depolarizes, that I can have long spin lifetimes for semiconductors. But in this kind of a scheme where I need to switch the, the state of a nanomagnet, these diffusive spin currents in semiconductors have not been shown to work so far. We don't know if they will work. And so I need to find a material for this channel that's going to help me do this. And so this is where um, the idea of topological insulators comes along. So for the remaining part of the talk now, I'm going to switch gears and basically try to convince you that there is this class of materials that have existed for a long time. Some of you who work on thermoelectrics have had them sitting in your shelves and you've been studying them for a long time. There are other materials that I won't mention that you can actually find in nature, you know, that so they're just minerals that, that have these structures and, and band structures and so on. Um, so, uh, so, so what is this idea of topological insulators? So let me start at the very beginning. And very often in science, one comes across ideas that gain a lot of momentum, they gain a lot of hype, um, and, uh, and, and, and people get a lot of attention for the work they're doing in these areas. And very often, 
the genesis of these ideas has actually already been there. And certainly this is one case where that is, where that is true. Um, so it turns out that in 1985, you know, roughly a couple of decades ago, there was this paper published by a couple of Russian theorists, um, appeared in one of uh, really good Russian journals. Um, and look at the title of that paper. It says, two-dimensional massless electrons in an inverted contact. This is the kind of language that you'll hear Josh Robinson and Mauricio and, and Pulikal, you know, use when they're talking about graphene. Well, the idea that these guys had was that imagine that you take two semiconductors, say lead telluride and tin telluride. Um, lead telluride and tin telluride have this interesting characteristic that one is an ordinary semiconductor with a, with a gap. The other one has what's called an inverted gap. In other words, um, the, um, the conduction band and the valence band, the nature of these electronic states is switched when you go to certain materials with inverted bands. And this happens particularly when you have strong spin orbit coupling. Now, if you make a heterostructure of this kind, then if you want this, um, you know, the bands to connect to each other um, in, a, in, in, you know, in a logical way, um, you find that, well, y y the electronic states will sort of evolve like that near the interface. And so right at the interface, what you find is that you're going to have a metallic state. Um, so the, the two semiconductors on each side have gaps, but at the middle, you have something that's a metallic state. And it turns out that this metallic state is described by an equation that you don't need to understand, but just for those of you who are physicists, um, so it's an equation that looks you know, like a Dirac equation. And, um, and, and then what you find is that the electronic states in this structure, in, in this kind of an interface state, um, are going to have a dispersion. Their energy as a function of crystal momentum is going to be linear in crystal momentum. And these are what is known as these Dirac fermions. Now what's interesting about this kind of proposal is that if you actually solve the problem completely, you find that the electron spin um, sort of follows the momentum as you go around what is known as the Dirac cone. So if you go, if an electron, effectively what this translates into is that if I'm an electron moving in this direction, my spin is going to be up, but if I want to move in the opposite direction because of time reversal symmetry, the spin has to point down, okay? That's the basic idea. Now, very recently, um, uh, and, and just to give you an example uh, of you know, how one compares band structures, this is the kind of band structure that everyone in this room who has taken a solid state class and learned about, say, semiconductors, this is the kind of band structure that you're used to, right? In energy states go parabolically with, um, with momentum, um, whereas in graphene, for example, there is this linear band structure that others will talk about later, um, and this is the kind of band structure that you get in these um, interface states, okay? So the idea is that whereas in a semiconductor, or in graphene, the spin up and spin down electrons both are occupying the same states that degenerate. Or, you know, in these, um, in these other materials, uh, you know, the spin up electrons and the spin down electrons depend on the momentum state. Now, this has led to some, um, a lot of attention to the theorists particularly who have come up with these, who have revived these ideas in recent times. Um, and they've done it in a way that really moves that old paper 20 years ago um, into a much more rigorous mathematical domain. They use ideas from topology, mathematical ideas from topology, um, to describe the electronic states that come up at these interfaces and, and so on. And, um, and they've, they've received a, a, a lot of prizes and recognition for this. As one of the gentlemen up on the screen, and I won't point out which one, says there's only one more prize to go. Um, so. Uh, um, so this kind, of, um, you know, this kind of special interface state has indeed been seen. It's been, done, it's been done by this experimentalist who is at the University of Würzburg, and the way he did it was by designing a mercury telluride, mercury cadmium telluride quantum well structure. And when he made such a, structu such a structure, if you tune the structure parameters into the right regime, then what you find is that if you study the resistance of the structure, you find that it becomes approximately quantized in fundamental units of h over e squared. And the way one understands this is that as you flow a current in this structure, you have edge states that propagate with spin up in one direction and spin down if they're flowing in the opposite direction. There's no direct proof of the spin polarization, but it's strongly suggested by using what's known as Landauer analysis you know, of these resistances.
okay? Now, these materials like mercury telluride, mercury cadmium telluride, um, are, we certainly know how to make them. I mean, you know, it's, it's a technology that is highly developed, but you can't get any funding for it in universities these days because they're already at this level of development where they're being used by the defense services for infrared imaging and so on. And believe me, you don't want to work with mercury when you want to do something like molecular beam epitaxy. It's just not worth it unless there's a real reason to do it. Um, but, um, but interestingly enough, some of these other theorists came up with a much more interesting idea, in my opinion. They argued that you can take a three-dimensional crystal, right? So you don't need to make a, a, an interface state or anything like that. You just take a three-dimensional semiconductor. Certain classes of semiconductors, these are typically narrow band gap semiconductors with large spin orbit coupling, um, they have, uh, once you calculate their electronic properties, you find that they will support a surface state, not an interface state, but a surface state which will have the kind of characteristics that we are talking about. In other words, the surface will be described by an electronic dispersion that looks like this. Looks exactly like graphene in, its, in this energy structure, um, but the spin and the momentum are locked, just like in the two-dimensional interface state I talked about. Um, and what's interesting about this is that if you can um, look at such a structure when you apply an electric field, then you find that the Fermi circle, as it shifts in the electric field, is going to imply that your electron current is going to be largely spin polarized. In other words, the charge transport in these materials, if it is constrained solely to the surface, is going to be inherently spin polarized. And that's naturally what you want for something like spintronics, right? Um, so the big challenge here is um, what kind of materials are you, going to, uh, are you going to use? Well, there were DFT calculations that were done by many groups, and one of the leaders in this area, we were lucky enough to attract him here, he's an assistant professor in physics, Chao Xing Liu. He carried out one of the most highly cited papers in this field, um, uh, most highly cited work in this field, um, and, he, and you know, he showed that there's a whole class of materials, the bismuth chalcogenides, which are largely tetradamide crystals, um, that have these kinds of special states. So if you look you know, inside the gap of these materials, you find that there are these surface states that have the Dirac-like linear dispersion. Okay? Um, so, so we now have predictions some years ago, and a lot of experimentalists and crystal growers like myself um, you know, quickly jumped into this field and started to, to explore how to make these materials. You can make them either by by bulk crystal growth, you can make them by, um, you know, you, you can make them by CVD. Um, Joan Redwing is doing that over here. And in my case, we use molecular beam epitaxy, or MBE, to grow these materials. Um, so we have an MBE system at Penn State, which consists of two chambers in my lab. There's a chamber that grows these bismuth calcogenides, another chamber that is linked via an ultra-high vacuum channel um, that grows three, five semiconductors, and so we can make heterostructures of different kinds and so on. And, um, and, and one of my uh, research associates, um, 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 Rich, uh, Anthony Richardella, has been exploring the growth of, uh, MBE growth of these um, types of samples on a variety of substrates. Um, what you see up, my fingers are too quick here. Sorry. Let me just get to the right slide. Okay, there we go. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've carried out, um, sometimes an iPad is not the best thing to use. We've carried out the growth of a variety of these materials on different kinds of substrates, and um, we've characterized them with transmission electron microscopy, with, um, you know, with uh, X-ray diffraction, and so on. These are not the best MBE-grown samples. They typically have X-ray Diffract, you know, X-ray rocking curves um, of for something like three or four hundred arc seconds, so they do have defects in them. Um, the surfaces are often, as you will see in a minute, uh, you know, they, they have kind of terraces that, that occur on these surfaces. Um, there are certainly defects that occur that are nucleated at the interface with the substrate and so on. But nonetheless, I would like to point out to you and show you in the remaining slides 
that um, they have these surface characteristics that are expected for topological insulators. So how do we look for these surface states? Well, we used angle-resolved photoemission spectroscopy. These are measurements that are being done in collaboration with my colleague Zaid Hassan at Princeton. What we do is that we make an MBE-grown sample, we cap it with selenium, so we passivate the surface, and then um, when, when, when these samples are introduced into an ultra-high vacuum chamber for the photoemission, the passivating layer can be removed, and what you get then in the photoemission is a map of the electronic band structure, um, you know, the energy as a function of momentum. And you can see that you get these, um, you know, these, uh, th these um, linear surface states that are predicted theoretically. Now, one of the things that I would like to point out is that the Fermi energy in many of these grown samples is way up here. So the Dirac point, right, the point where that cone sort of intersects over there is down here, but the Fermi energy is up here. And up here is also where the bulk states are. So when you grow these crystals, one of the difficulties that experimentalists are still facing is the, are that um, one of the difficulties that experimentalists are still facing, um, oh God, what is going on here? This is really misbehaving, sorry. Yeah, let me just get to the right slide. Okay. Um, so one of the um, interesting aspects about these materials is that you can certainly see these photoemission spectra revealing the, you know, this, uh, this surface band structure. Now, I told you that the electron spin and the momentum are connected with each other on these surfaces, right? Um, and the way one explores this is by using photoemission to look at the um, spin-resolved spectra. And you do that by using a gold foil which acts as a spin detector. And this is because of a phenomenon known as moth scattering. And if you now look at these photoemission spectra and you, you resolve their, their spin state, you find indeed that the spins are following the directions that are predicted by theory, right? So as you look at the spin states, you find that the spins are in plane and they circle around the Dirac cone as shown in this cartoon that I've, that I've depicted over here. So one question then is, um, I just told you that um, the um, Fermi energy is far up into the conduction band in many of these as-grown samples of topological insulators such as bismuth selenide. Um, is there a way to, um, you know, to reduce that bulk conduction because of these, um, you know, because of these defects that occur in, in, in the samples? And one way that uh, many experimentalists are finding out, and this is something that we've been doing too, is by doping the samples with antimony. When you put antimony into some of these crystals, you find that the antimony offsets the, de the effect of the defects that are created in your as-grown samples. And as a result of that, you can put an electric gate on a sample, and you can change the carrier density quite a bit. And in fact, you can change the Fermi energy to the point where it eventually reaches the Dirac point, and that's what's indicated by this maximum in resistance in this, in this um, data over here. If you now look at the magnetoresistance, the resistance as a function of magnetic field, you get the kind of magnetoresistance curves that are shown in, uh, on this graph over here. And without going into too many details, the analysis of these kinds of magnetoresistance curves tells you that there are two-dimensional states um, and these two-dimensional states are following a phenomenon known as weak anti-localization. And you can really understand this in terms of these topological surface states that are expected to uh, exist in these materials. Um, but that, you know, that's still very indirect kind of information about these surface states. And one of my students, um, Abhinav Kandala, came up with an idea to look for the existence of these surface states by looking at what are known as conductance fluctuations. So you can imagine this experiment as essentially measuring the interference of electron waves as they propagate in a sample. And these conductance fluctuations have been seen in many, many kinds of materials over the last several decades. The basic idea is you go to the random fab, you make a sample which is, you make a device which is much smaller, whose dimensions are much smaller than the, um, than the coherence length of electron waves in the sample. And so you get coherent interference of electron waves as they scatter off of defects and impurities and so on. And this interference gives you a fingerprint. It gives you 
a, what's called a magneto fingerprint if you study the resistance as a function of magnetic field. What you find is that the resistance fluctuates in what appears to be a random and arbitrary way, but it's completely reproducible. So for example, all these little wiggles and all that that you see in the data that I've shown on the screen um, are completely reproducible. You can do it a thousand times and you will get exactly the same curve. Now, what you find is that if you take the magnetic field and you tilt it away from the z direction, so as you take the magnetic field and you tilt it towards the in-plane direction, and you plot all your data as a function of the perpendicular component of the magnetic field, um, oh, come on, this is really annoying, okay. Um, If you plot it as a function of the perpendicular component of the magnetic field, you find that the data completely scale with this perpendicular component, right? Um, and so that tells you that what you're seeing is a two-dimensional phenomenon. It's most likely a surface phenomenon. Um, now we can, we can sort of, we can um, make this argument much more rigorous by looking at the sensitivity of this magneto fingerprint to the nature of the surface. And so what Abhinav did was that he characterized his surfaces by using atomic force microscopy. And what he finds is that if you look at a typical device, then in the region that you're measuring, you might contain just one or two of these terraces that are arising from, uh, that are arising at the surface of your sample. So these are little pyramid-like terraces that grow on the surface of the sample as you make your, uh, as you epitaxially grow your sample in the MBE chamber. And if you now analyze these fluctuations, you find that these fluctuations have a periodic component to them. And that periodic component is indicating that there are electron waves that are making their way across the sample and going around orbits that are on these terraces. And this is known as the Aronoff-Bohm effect. And if you look at the characteristic period and try to relate it to the typical size of a pyramid or a terrace that you get inside your sample, you find that there is a pretty good consistent agreement between these numbers. So it strongly suggests that when you look at coherent transport, when you look at the interference of electron waves on the surfaces you know, that are traveling on the surfaces of these samples, these are really uh, um, signals that are coming from the surface state and perhaps not the bulk state. Now, I want to finish off this talk then. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? Five, five, five minutes? Five or 10 minutes, great. So I want to finish off now um, the rest of the talk by talking about um, you know, how one goes about trying to do spintronics with these topological insulators. So I hope I've been able to convince you that we can make these crystals that have surface states of the kind that are predicted by theory. Um, they have the spin polarization that one expects. I've been able to show you that, well, if you study transport, electronic transport, that it suggests the electronic transport is being, um, is being uh, supported by these surface states. And now the question is, can we do something with spin? So the ideas here are, are quite simple. One of the basic ideas is make something that looks like, um, essentially looks like a MOSFET, looks like this, except that what you have in the middle is a ferromagnet that's in contact with the topological insulator. Now, it turns out that because the ferromagnet breaks time reversal symmetry, that Dirac cone that you had, you know, the, with, with a Dirac point, instead of preserving its metallic character, you open up a gap at the Dirac point. And this is purely a, a, a consequence of, um, of breaking time reversal symmetry. So it turns out that if you take a ferromagnetic magnetization and you change it from in plane to out of plane, then what's supposed to happen is that this Dirac cone is supposed to become like this Dirac cone. In other words, something with a gap. And that would allow you to you know, modulate the, the state of the device. There are other ideas that have to do with magnetic domain walls and so on that I won't go into. But the basic idea is that combining magnetism with topological insulators gives us a pathway towards um, fabricating interesting devices. Now, if the lights were dimmer, you'd probably see this a bit clearer, but we've been able to make um, different kinds of um, um, topological insulator heterostructures, either by directly magnetically doping the topological insulator, for example, putting manganese into bismuth selenide, and this is a cross-sectional high-resolution TEM image of such a crystal. We've also been able to make heterostructures in which we take a ferromagnet, such as magnetically doped gallium arsenide, 
and then EPIT actually put a topological insulator on top of that. Um, and so there are a variety of different systems that one can make. Um, it turns out that if you put manganese into bismuth selenide, if you magnetically dope a topological insulator, it has an interesting consequence. Um, our colleagues at Princeton who can do X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, this is a technique that probes the magnetism just at the surface of a sample, have shown that um, you can get ferromagnetic ordering in, at the surface of magnetically doped bismuth selenide, and the ferromagnetic ordering has an ordering temperature which is somewhere in the vicinity of 100 to 150 Kelvin. Um, so one thing that one might wonder then is what is the consequence of having this ferromagnetic order? What does it do? Oh, I'm really sorry. I, this is, um, I don't know why this is happening. It usually works just fine. So. So while this is loading up again, let me just um, tell you. So, um, so essentially the idea is that when you have these magnetically doped samples, one question that one might have is what happens to the state, the Dirac state? What happens to that cone um, you know, that is created by, um, by, um, by these surface states? And what we find in, in, um, in our studies of angle resolved photoemission is that you can clearly show that as a result of that magnetic ordering, you open up a gap at the Dirac point. And this is purely due to the magnetic ordering. Uh, it's purely due to the breaking of time reversal symmetry. And so it gives you a way in which you can, um, in, in which you can really um, manipulate the nature of that Dirac cone by using, um, you know, by using magnetism, okay? Now, um, you know, Clive, I may be in trouble here, so I, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to wait a little bit and see if it turns on, but um, it's the first time it's done this. I have no idea. I've used this thing we, we many places. While we boot up. Sure. So let's see if it comes back up. If it comes back up, I'll, you know, I'll be happy to answer questions. I mean, I'll be happy to show um, the additional slides. Um, so, so well, well, thank you very much indeed for an excellent talk. Um, uh, <laughs> You remained remarkably calm in terms of your technical problems there. Yeah, I know. It teaches me a lesson about using this iPad too often. So, so do we have some questions from the audience first? Okay, well, while the audience is thinking, I'm going to ask a couple yeah, of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, how big is the gap when we break the direct point? Um, it can be as large as uh, 100 milli electron volts is, um, you know, what, what so the, um, the, the gap itself of the, um, the, the gap of the um, bismuth selenide itself, the bulk gap is around 300 MeV. Um, and what the photoemission experiments seem to show is that uh, you can open up a gap, as, you know, approaching something like 100 MeV. Yeah. It's a selenium vacancy that's, that's the problem. Okay. So is there any way to manipulate the gross parameter, like the partial pressure? Yeah. So in, the, so, so, so in MBE growth, that's definitely something that, that, that we've been trying um, with not too much success, though. Um, and, and the idea is that uh, um, by using... I mean, precisely, by using MBE growth, uh, you know, one hopes to be able to um, control these parameters. But um, what, what has been perhaps more successful, um, you know, has been this, um, um, what, what's perhaps been more successful has been um, Bob Kava's attempts at actually growing crystals uh, from the, in the bulk, you know, where he is able to control this stoichiometry somewhat better. Um, and so... What I wanted to show you, of course, was, was this ARPES spectra where um, when, you do mag when you carry out magnetic doping, um, you, can, you can observe these gaps opening up at, at the Dirac point. Now, the difficulty, of course, at this point is that there is enough disorder in these samples. There's enough variation in these gaps across the sample that you don't see it as a very clean and straightforward opening up of the gap. You see it as a suppression of the gap, right? Um, by analyzing the data very, very carefully, you can actually make out these, you can 
extract these numbers, you know, that, that, um, uh, that, that I was mentioning of around 100 MeV or so. There are other experiments that are being carried out where it uses an, a scanning tunneling microscope to actually look at these gaps also. And you find that the gaps vary all over the place as you go across the sample. So that's still something that we need to figure out. And that, again, is probably related to this idea of, um, you, you know, of the stoichiometry and, and the defects in the samples, right? Now, one of the interesting um, aspects that comes out from these kinds of measurements is that, um, um, you know, is that if you look at the, um, if you look at the um, spin polarization of the surface states, you find that the spin polarization takes on the kind of structure that I've shown on the screen here. So when you open up a gap in the sample, instead of getting these spins which are in plane, you now start getting spins that are pointing out of the plane as you see, you know, in this, um, in, in this image here, okay? Um, so, so, the, so the basic idea is that, is that by playing around with these, um, with, with these uh, um, you know, uh, with these kinds of materials, either by opening up a gap using magnetic doping or by opening up a gap by using other non-magnetic techniques, you can really engineer the nature of the spin texture at these surfaces. And the big challenge for this field right now is how to take these ideas, these ideas that the spin texture at the surfaces can be manipulated in different ways, and then translate it into transport devices, electrical transport devices, where you can change the state of a device, you know, by, by changing the spin texture. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. One more question. Yeah. And then um, I realized that bismuth is uh, one of the famous Yeah, bismuth is the more commonly used one. And so yeah. what, I, what I'm wondering is, is there any fundamental connection between you know, tier six or a couple of different solution states and thermoelectric materials? I mean, I don't think the, I, I don't think the thermoelectric properties have any, I don't think there's a fundamental connection between something being a thermoelectric and something being a topological insulator, having topological insulator surface states. I don't think so. Um, but there is an interesting opportunity where, um, again, these are just calculations. <laughs> this is not um, experiments yet. But there are certainly predictions that, that having a topological insulator surface state can, in fact, um, um, you know, give rise to interesting thermoelectric phenomena that you might be able to enhance certain thermoelectric properties by, by using, you know, topological insulators. And, you know, so that's certainly quite, uh, that's certainly quite possible. And, um, and, and one thing that I might finish off on, since I didn't quite get to it, is um, that one might wonder whether these topological states can be used in any way at room temperature for doing something interesting. And so far, there is only one experiment where there is a hint of this possibility. And this is an experiment being done at Cornell in which our bismuth selenide films are combined with permalloy. And then one carries out a measurement at microwave <coughs> frequencies of an effect called the spin hall effect. And what you find is that compared to all the different materials, and you know, this, this parameter may not, doesn't have to mean anything to anyone in this room, but it's a parameter that's significant in, spin, in spintronics. It's called the spin hall angle. And it turns out that if you compare the spin hall angle for many of the materials that have been studied so far in conventional spintronics with bismuth selenide, you find that uh, bismuth selenide has the largest spin hall angle. So, and this is all at room temperature. So there is certainly a great promise for doing something interesting with these surface states. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, and I apologize for the technical thing, so...